Well, welcome to the Good Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Good. My guest for this episode is Lita Citroen, who is an executive coach, personal branding consultant, and reputation management expert, helping global executives, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders manage how they are perceived and drive them toward ideal opportunities. In today's episode, we are talking about her new book, The New Rules of Influence, How to Authentically Build Trust, Drive Change, and Make an Impact. During this episode, we're going to delve into the new rules of influence, breaking down the first two sections of her book. We talk about why being courageous, real, and credible matters so much. And we also explore ways for you to have a lasting impact and include others in a meaningful way, no matter when or how they show up. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Good Leadership Podcast, where we engage with esteemed thought leaders and explore research-backed strategies and techniques that empower leaders at every level to achieve meaningful results that drive lasting change. Welcome to the program, Lita, again. Thank you so much, Charles. Wonderful to be with you. Lita, I always like to start with just a little bit of background and explain to our listeners your background and really what led you to write this book at this time. Well, my background is I spent 20 years in the corporate arena uh, doing all the traditional steps that most of us do, climbing the corporate ladder, trying to break that glass ceiling and all that stuff. And I never really felt like me. I know it's a weird thing to say, but I never felt like I was being my truest self, but I didn't know what that would look like. I started my own company and started to have more meaningful conversations and different conversations that pushed me out of that box I think I had been in and written several books. This is my seventh book. And my new publisher actually asked me or challenged me with something different. They said, we want you to write a book about influence, but not a business book. We want you to write a book that comes from your heart. And that's a book I couldn't have written when I was in my corporate career. I couldn't have written it 10 years ago. I had to write it now because everything I've learned from my own journey and then helping hundreds, if not thousands of global clients all over the world is that we're all trying to make ourselves heard. We're all trying to be that best version of ourselves, that truest version, but we don't really know what that looks like. So that's why I wrote the book. Well, wonderful. And you say the old rules don't work. So why do we need new rules of influence? Well, when I say the old rules, I, I think of that classic picture of executive presence, right? That the poster child of executive presence was, you know, a well-dressed man in a navy or charcoal suit wearing a red tie. And he was an executive. And that's what we were taught we were supposed to look like and emulate. And traditional teaching around executive presence says it's about gravitas image and communication. And those are fabulous pillars and they work for a lot of people. Gravitas is this amorphous thing that sometimes we, it's like we know it when we see it, but we don't know how to teach it. So that's fun. Image is looking a certain way, dressing a certain way, carrying yourself a certain way. And then your communication is having these sort of scripted narratives, if you will, that are on point, that have the right sound bites. And Honestly, it just didn't work for most of us. So I think there's room for traditional executive presence teaching, but I think for the rest of us who maybe don't want to wear a suit, don't want to be an executive, don't want to look like that, we, we needed a place to fit in. And that's where new rules came from. It came from a call. I don't know if it was the pandemic or before the pandemic, a call for realness and authenticity and inclusivity and diversity and all these things that we hear about, but how do they translate into executive presence? And can I have executive presence? Can I be influential if I don't have the title, the rank or the authority? So I kind of deconstruct the idea of executive presence for those of us who just didn't fit the model. And we're struggling all those years trying to figure out where's our place to have our voice heard. Well, and you list 10 rules, and I could think of, you know, 20, 50 rules. So <laughs> Me too. <laughs> why did you uh, select 10 for this influence recipe? They were the 10 that, in my experience, have worked and are consumable. And baked into those 10 are other ideas, other rules, if you want to call them. For instance, integrity comes very close with being credible. But let's face it, we can remember 10 if, if we really focus on it, but we can't remember 50. 
And I wanted to give people a start to creating their own journey in a way that was easy to understand, not overly complicated. And I like how you state in the book, too, that as you move through the book and through these rules, remember that authority, rank, and role do not equal influence. Technical competence, good intentions, and hard work do not create influence. And you cannot mandate or manipulate or cajole others to feel, follow, or forgive you for what you bring. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. There are a lot of senior executives and senior thought leaders who believe that because people follow what they recommend or what they mandate, that they have influence. But what happens when we see somebody at a, maybe a lower rank in the company offer an idea and that idea takes hold? Or we see someone who doesn't have the Ivy League education or the pedigree start a movement or an initiative that changes the complexion of a community. Like influence doesn't come just from rank. We can coerce, we can, we can, you know, make people fall in line if their paycheck depends on it. But I'm really talking about something more meaningful than just compliance. Wonderful. Well, let's define influence. And you give a good definition in the book of influence if you want to share that with the audience and just kind of get them on the same page as you. The way I see influence is that it is encouraging followership, but it doesn't mean you have to be a leader, right? Not everybody wants to lead. Some people just want to have the courage and the influence to be able to raise their hand in a meeting and know that they'll be taken seriously. They'll face the, the potential judgment and all of that that comes with, you know, raising your hand maybe for the first time. But we want to know that our voice matters, that when we say something, we have the credibility, we have thought of all the different perspectives, we have a service mindset, and therefore our influence brings people towards us. It brings people towards the vision that we are trying to build. I love that definition. And you also have some other terms that you define, which I think are great to kind of go over as well as what does it mean to be a person of influence? or having influence? If you could just define those two to get people clear on that, because I think people kind of in this day and age, everyone thinks they're a person of influence or they have some level of influence depending on their role or job responsibilities. And I think that goes back, Charles, to what we were talking about with, with rank and authority, right? If, if I have the title, then people will follow. But look what's happening on social media. Someone can be a person of influence on social media simply because they have a large followership and people align with their values and their vision and what they what they stand for. And therefore they, re, you know, they recommend a toothbrush or a car and people run out to go get that same thing. So having influence, being a person of influence is, is all about being a conduit, if you will, for that which is driving authentic trust, impact, and positive change. And there's also different types of influence. And you list four different types of influence. It's persuasive influence, demonstrative influence, inspiring influence, and informative influence. You know, and maybe that was that was my wanting to lean back into my writing as a business author, um, because we have to have some definitions, right? It's, it's, it's part of what we like. And I think demonstrative influence, as I was thinking about it, is someone who does something and doesn't necessarily teach us that, but shows us by example. And we see people all day long who are living what they believe is true and right and, and healthy and good. And we just emulate that and we learn from that because they're living that. Persuasive influence is probably more my style because I like to motivate people and show them a better way. And I do that through persuasion, through sharing information, demonstrating a walk the talk, but really persuading them to see that they're capable of more. So having different forms of influence is, is something kind of grisly to chew on because I think it gives the book a little more substance. But really what we're talking about is, is anyone anywhere who wants to be seen and heard for who they are and how they are. That's the person who can have influence, whatever form of influence you want to have. Great. Well, let's move now into these rules. And the first one is really around discovering your why. And it has three rules within this section, and it's be courageous, be real, and be credible. And, and let's start with that courageous piece. Why do you need courage in order to have influence? 
Well, the, the first section of the book, Discover Your Why, is really about getting clear on your purpose. Because if your motivation is financial gain or power, then that's really not who the book is for. So if your if your purpose, if your why is clear around, I I want to live a life that is fulfilling and meaningful, and yes, I need to provide for my family, and but but I want to make sure that I'm living the purpose I'm designed here for. Then that's the chapter that sort of unfolds that and. The first thing you have to do in order to ask yourself those hard questions is to be courageous. When I look at the clients I've worked with or the people that I admire in our community or in our world, it's people who are unapologetic about what they believe in. They're willing to listen to other ideas. They're willing to consider different viewpoints because that inclusive mentality and mindset is very important but they're not moving off that dime. I mean, they are steadfast in what they believe in an unwavering way. And they have the courage to take the slings and arrows that come with that. Now, on a smaller scale, courage can look like someone who's always been sort of behind the scenes stepping forward a little bit. And instead of giving someone else the idea that they share in a meeting, sharing that idea themselves. And that can be really scary that can be terrifying for people to be, because all, all the eyes are going to look at them. And now they're the subject of what could be a great idea, but could also be a bad idea. So having the courage to share that, I think, is where the book starts. The, the foundation of the book is the first chapter, is, is chapter that, that focuses on why, but the rest of the rules kind of move around them. The second one is real. And I intentionally don't want to use the word authentic. The word authentic in 2023, I mean, it, it got what Merriam Webster's word of the year. It was celebrated. I don't know if there was a crown and a sash and a parade. I don't know. But everybody uses the term authentic. I'm guilty of using the, the term authentic. But what does that really mean? It reminds me of gravitas, right? We know it when we see it, but we really don't know how to teach it. So I went with the word real because I think it's one thing to say, Charles, I'm going to be real with you here. Or, you know, get real. Let's get real. We know, we, we kind of intuitively, culturally know what that means and what it looks like. And it's, it's taking off all the fluff, right? Removing the smoke and mirrors and showing the soft underbelly of who we are in a vulnerable way. And also terrifying. But if you've done the first rule and you have courage, you're going to be a little more, more comfortable with it. And then on top of that comes credibility, which <clears throat> is articulating your values and walking the talk. Values plus action equals credibility. If you tell me what you stand for, what are your core principles, your core moral values, and then how do you live that way? The more I see evidence of that, the more I give you credibility. So if you're courageous and you're willing to take this journey, if you are open to being real, and asking yourself the hard questions. I ask a lot of hard questions in that book. So you got to be ready for that. And then you can establish credibility. Now you're on the path to starting to build influence. Wonderful. Well, let's dive into each one of those just briefly. Uh, courage isn't guaranteed to make you popular, famous, celebrated, or followed. But you state it's one rule among the 10 that you must follow internalize in order to become a person of influence that you were meant to be. And I love, like you said, the questions that you give in the book, self-reflection questions that really kind of dive deep. You know, when did you show courage? Are you able to identify times in the past where you demonstrated it? Because I think playing off of that really helps people to say, well, I'm not a very courageous person. But if they come to think back in times in their past where they were, that'll give them the necessary means to, to exude it and exhibit it moving forward. Yeah, we all have moments of courage and they may be huge moments of courage or small but meaningful moments of courage and being able to have those close by and, and reflect on those and say, okay, maybe I'm not doing anything as big as when I had to, you know, leave that marriage or quit that great job or something that really took a lot of courage, but I know how to be courageous. And in the things I learned afterwards are what make me who I am then we can sort of use that as momentum. It is scary. It's scary for me. Writing this book was a step outside of my comfort zone. And there were many times I wanted to default to what felt safe. 
citing all this research and putting all of other people's opinions in the book. But I was challenged to speak from my heart. And in order to have other people learn from that, I had to do it myself. And it is scary. But we also know that if we're doing it for the right reasons, then it's the right thing to do. And we don't want to be courageous recklessly. We don't want to just post an opinion on social media just for the shock value under the guise of being brave or courageous. But it's thoughtful courage. And courage isn't the absence of fear. It's just using that fear, understanding it, and going forward despite the fear. I agree. And during that second rule, too, I love how you didn't use authenticity. You used realness because it's a little bit more tangible. But explain to me the difference between realness and transparency, because I hear that a lot, where if I'm being real, I'm just being transparent. And they're really not the same thing, are they? They're really not. And, and I'm fully on record as not a fan of transparency. I think it's dangerous and I don't think it's necessary. Now, let me qualify that. If you're proposing an idea to your boss and you want to show that you need extra funding for a project, for instance, you're going to need to show transparent reasoning because otherwise it's not going to make sense. But when it comes to who we are and where we come from and our backstory, some of that's very personal. And some of it has nothing to do with where we're going or who we who we are today in the context of where we're going. But there's this almost cultural, and I say cultural meaning international culture, an obligation to share that. We have to share all our wounds and our traumas and our crises in order to build community. And I don't know where that's written. It's very dangerous on social media to be that transparent. Just because somebody posts something, maybe even tags you in it, or an idea is shared that you agree with or don't agree with, it doesn't mean you have to chime in. There are certain things we're allowed to keep private. We absolutely are. I think it's an important lesson to teach children too, as they start to build their social profiles, because that understanding or, or obligation to share things that are, that are allowed to be private, it, it doesn't exist. It's a social construct. So keeping things private, being very clear about what you want to put out in the world, knowing that once you put it out there on social media, in a meeting, in a conversation or an email, you're making it public. As long as you're a, a, in, intentional about that, then it's part of your being real. But I don't think you have to be transparent. Well, and regarding rule number three, you had just briefly mentioned the credibility formula. I'd just like to, for you to unpack that a little bit more. So it's values plus action equals credibility. Being credible really requires you to be clear on your values and what you stand for, which takes some self-reflection. And I don't think many leaders or individuals for that matter are really clear on their top values that they live by. I can tell you from doing a lot of work in this area, most of us aren't. <laughs> you know, we go through life and our parents' values, our culture's values, our societal values, our friends' values, our spouses' or our partners' values, they start to influence how we see the world. But what I'm asking the reader to do in this case is to strip all that away and say, what do you stand for? What is so fundamental to who you are as a human being and an individual that if that wasn't there, you wouldn't be you. And then let's define that, right? So I hear the word honesty a lot. Okay, let's talk about honesty. Is it honesty? Is it candor? Is it directness? Is it, you know, what is the value there? Because what matters isn't what I think it should be. It's what you, what you live by, because that's what you're going to show evidence for in the action and earn credibility. And two values you mentioned in the book that you live by are gratitude and generosity. Yeah. And they came so obvious to me. I have other values. I mean, of course, I, I, I have values of integrity and inclusivity and, and love and faith. But the two that I pivot every decision around are gratitude and generosity. It's actually the title of my TED Talk as well, because they're that important to me. And they have led me to serve in the way that I serve, to grow my business in the way that I grow, to, to form a community around myself that is exactly what I wanted because I'm always looking for an opportunity to say thank you. And I celebrate everything I am given, everything I've worked hard for, and I live in the world of abundance and gratitude. I, I am that person. I'm obnoxiously happy. You know? And then generosity is my desire to always give more than is asked for. 
And I love to delight my clients, my audiences, my readers with more than they thought they were getting. And that's that spirit of generosity that I, I try to always say yes to opportunities, um, even if they cause me to work a little harder or later. If it's the right thing to do, I will always I will always share. Wonderful. And having the courage then to be real and the awareness to be credible is really how you uncover your why. So let's move to once we have identified that or have unpacked that, let's go to the next phase, which is find your who. And there's two rules to unpack in this section. And the first one is be of service. I'm a big fan of service. It doesn't have to be service in the way that I serve our military veterans. It doesn't have to be military service. But I think what defines leaders or people of influence is a, a fundamental mindset of service. It's not about me. It's not about getting and accumulating and hoarding. It's about thinking of the people around me, right? How can I help them grow? How can I enrich their lives? How can my vision make the, the team, the community, the world a better place. And when we see evidence of that, again, there's a realness that comes forward. There's credibility because it's anchored in values. And, and we see that courage to take an idea forward. The idea isn't about me. The idea is about those I serve. And it makes it so much easier then to take those ideas out into the public and know that, yeah, there are going to be some naysayers, but that's okay. We're willing to have those conversations, negotiate where we need to, and ultimately build the impact that we're looking for in our lifetime. And I'd love to go into your story because your turning point came in 2008, right? When everything was collapsing and missed all the turmoil and stress, two kids going off to college, you had done something you had never done before. You took a step back after being laid off from a high profile job and wrote a job description for what you'd love to do. Yeah. The yeah, problem was the job that? didn't exist, right? Uh, no, no, especially the salary didn't go with it at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, how many of us get a chance to really think about what we want to do next? And I had been in that hamster wheel of, you know, get the next job is more fun, more money, more prestige, and you just keep getting recruited. And for 20 years, that's what I did. And this was really the first time I stopped and said, but what does this all mean? Like, what is the, what does the past mean? And then what am I looking for in the future? What, what is my story and how do I want to influence the outcome of my life? And that's when I sort of took a pause and said, maybe I need to do this for myself. And I'd never wanted to be a business owner. I was not a risk taker. I still don't consider myself a risk taker. I like a paycheck. I liked PTO. I, I liked an office, you know, with a view and somebody else negotiated the rent. But going back to what we were talking about earlier, it was the most obvious thing I'd ever seen to have a business with my name on it that I could go out and serve and lead and create in the way that I wanted, putting all the risk of my family and my career on the line. It didn't feel scary at all. It felt like the most obvious thing I'd ever seen. Looking back, I should have been more scared <laughs> because the world was a scary place in 2008, but I wasn't scared. The courage just gave me a calm to go forward and do what I was supposed to do. When it was in November 2009 that you found your who at a Denver Broncos football game, you know, you learn of the challenges faced by many U.S. veterans leaving military service. Yeah. And I knew in 2008 when I started my company that I always wanted to have a, a piece sort of carved out for, for some type of philanthropic service because I'd always done that as part of my corporate jobs. And I loved that. So I just held space for it. I didn't know who I was going to serve or how or where. But then you're right at that Denver Broncos football game. It wasn't a pretty game, but <laughs> it was meaningful for me. Because at halftime, they, they brought some service members on stage to talk about transition. And it happened to be the week of Veterans Day. And what they were describing, you know, I don't know how to sell myself. I don't know how to tell my story. I don't know how to figure out what to do after the military. Well, that's exactly what I had built a company for. And I decided I wanted to find a way to help, having absolutely no connection or knowledge about the military. Again, I wish she'd been a little more scared than she was, but it just seemed obvious that I had to find a way. 
Well, and I think this is really true for a lot of people. You know, we live in a world where many people are selfish, like you state, self-absorbed and concerned only about what directly benefits them. But true and lasting influence doesn't come from getting and accumulating. It comes from giving and serving. And I know it sounds corny. It sounds, you know, like one of those greeting cards. But when you give, you get so much more back. And I have given thousands of hours to coaching and mentoring military service members, veterans, and military spouses. I have spoken at conferences and events and funded my own way there, which was really fun as a brand new entrepreneur. But I did all that not because I wanted something, but because I was a grateful American, I still am, who found a way to say thank you for your service. And I think where we forget is is what you get in return. So while I didn't get money, the love and the support and the the pride that I get knowing that I made this much of a difference in the in the life of someone who raised their hand and fought for my freedom, like that that's immeasurable. No dollar amount can can give me what that feeling gives me. So I'm not saying we want to go hungry, and I'm grateful that my business actually afforded me the opportunity to carve that piece out. So once you identify your people, the ones that you're going to serve with passion, trust, and authenticity, make sure you're well-versed on what they care about because you have an, a great insight here. Just because you see a need doesn't mean you're the right person to solve that need. We see a lot of that in, in companies when leadership tries to take a position on an issue or community that they don't come from or have adequate knowledge of under the DEI umbrella under various you know political conversations we see that as a mistake and it's really an opportunity i didn't come from the military but i learned everything i could i embedded myself in that community so that i could understand the nuances and speak to the issues and the opportunities in a in an intelligent way i didn't just start talking about the military on on tv and in podcasts and not know what I was talking about. That would be doing such a disservice to the community I was standing up for. So I think when we see it need in a, in a market or a community or a team that we don't come from, it's just about understanding that you have to do your homework. You have to ask the right questions. You have to listen and consider and negotiate with yourself. How does that fit for me? Is my mission, is my vision still the same or does it apply somewhere else? That's that's what I talk about when I mention that in the book. And actions matter to those that we serve. It's not just enough to tell someone to follow you and to know they have your back or you have their back. You have to show them over and over because they're not expecting you to be perfect, you state, but they're counting on you to be real. And the first time you had an opportunity to teach a program on military transition, you kind of learned that firsthand, correct? Oh, yes. Charles, I walked into that that program. And I had my laptop, I had my clicker, I had my PowerPoint. I thought I was ready to go. I was teaching personal branding for the military to civilian transition. And I looked around and I had, I think, three double amputees. The first person who met me at the door, this gentleman who's still a really good friend of mine, was missing most of his face and both of his hands from an IED explosion. And they looked at me and I looked at them and I was like, I am so out of my element here. And we huddled and we had a conversation and really good things came out of that meeting and subsequent meetings because I was able to sort of take a step back and say, okay, what I thought I was coming in with, my sort of confirmation bias here, is not what they're living. And sometimes we have to do that. And that is really important. Even if you're just trying to change the mind or introduce a new idea in your team, it's just to be willing to put it out there and then let others sort of chew on that idea and see where it goes. And what do you say to people that say, you know, they want to be of service, but they don't have the time or it sounds too hard or they don't know where to start? <laughs> Those are such typical excuses. I get it. I didn't have time. I was starting a brand new business, eating what I got, what I found. And so the idea of doing something that wasn't profitable financially was very risky. There's always time. There's always time. It can be having a mentoring call with someone. It can be reaching out to someone on your team who just needs a little bit of a boost and sending them a, a pep talk email, right? It can be it can be small. It can be significant. It doesn't have to be grand. I think that's what the whole book is about is you don't have to start 
an international movement. It can be something small within your team. But if you want to serve someone else, you have to be looking for it. You have to be responding to what they need, not what you think they need, me with the PowerPoint and the clicker, (laughs) and be willing to, to meet them where they are and then bring them forward in the way that you authentically feel is best for them and see where it goes. And the other rule in this section regarding the who is inclusive. Being inclusive builds influence because you're choosing to be open, willing to hear different viewpoints and consider alternative ways, ideas, and visions. Yeah. And I actually had people remark when they saw that, they said, you included inclusivity. Like you were willing to go there. So much is written about it and so much is misunderstood about diversity and inclusivity. My approach to inclusivity is a mindset right? It's removing that sort of confirmation bias that I know the best way. I've done this so much. This is how we've always done it here. And asking questions instead. Make, looking around the room and saying, are the right people here? Are all the voices we need to hear from included? Is anyone left out? And being courageous enough to ask for those opinions to come in, to listen to them. I had a conversation with someone recently and she shared that she had brought an idea to her team. And one person on the team said, I got to tell you, that doesn't land right with my community. And she, everybody in the room turned to look at her and she said, thank you for that. Thank you. And they were shocked, right? They thought she would get upset. She was so grateful because how else would she have known unless somebody spoke up and said, "Mm, not really. I don't think you're going where you wanted to go. We need people like that. That's what makes us better. That makes our ideas better fleshed out. If we can be open and confident, it doesn't mean you have to change your mind. doesn't mean you have to be afraid you're going to get your mind changed. Nobody can do that for you. But you have to be willing to have a mindset of inclusivity that allows you to bring the right voices into the room to make your idea better. When inclusivity is broader than most people think of when they think of that term too, right? It's it's diversity of thought as much as it is diversity of experiences and cultural background. Absolutely. And, And that's scary. I mean, it's on social media, we see it going wrong all the time. So maybe we take the social media piece out for just a second and think about how we live our lives. When we're making decisions, when we're formulating our our vision and our plan, just taking a second, taking a beat and saying, are the right people included? Have I asked the right questions? Have I listened to what they said or have I listened to what they said that confirms what I wanted them to say? That's what we're really encouraging here. I hope this episode has provided you with valuable insights. If it has, I ask you to share it with someone who would also benefit from it. If you've been enjoying and gaining knowledge from this podcast, then subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the previous episodes of the podcast and additional learning resources. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple or Spotify and leave up to a five-star review.